In the last video, the standard behavior cloning approach, when applied to training our neural network policy model, didn't really deliver the autonomous driving results we had hoped for. In this video, I will dig a little deeper to try and understand why this was the case, and I'll look at two approaches that can be used to help achieve much better results. I'll also briefly introduce a simple way to evaluate the policy's autonomous driving skills, and then see how these improved policies perform. This is the eighth video in the overall project. The project is to build a deep learning Raspberry Pi controlled autonomous vehicle. The project will cover the system from end to end, from building the hardware, the base RC chassis, and attaching the Raspberry Pi and the associated electronics, and then getting it all working. It then works through the planning and development of the software that controls it all, as well as the training and the testing of various machine learning algorithms to see how well they go at line following. As we saw in the previous video, the application of plain old behavior cloning, where we train the neural network policy to try and mimic the behavior of our expert human driver, kind of worked in that eventually it was able to drive around the track a few times. But also kind of didn't work in that it also had a large number of offs or excursions from the track. The autonomous policy seemed to get the overall steering concept, but wasn't able to string things together consistently. So what gives? Hardware or software problems? Bugs? Or something else? Well, as it turns out, this is actually the expected result with behavior cloning. There's a subtle mismatch between conditions during training and those during autonomous driving, which we haven't really considered. To try and understand why, I will walk you through, at a high level, what we did when we trained the policy, and what actually happens when the autonomous driver takes control. So during the training phase, we have the track, and our expert driver starts to drive. They are an expert driver, so they do a pretty good job at following the line, and provide a good, positive set of data on which to train the policy. So from the driving data, we have the various images as inputs. And we train the policy model to be able to predict, fairly accurately, the next set of steering commands that were used by the expert driver to keep on the track. With enough data and a good model, we can get pretty accurate predictions. So that's the training scenario. Now let's see what happens when the autonomous driver takes over. If we take the same track, hopefully we should be able to closely match our expert driver. Now, starting the autonomous car at the same initial position. Here we have exactly the same camera view as the expert driver. Hence the predicted set of steering commands will be a good estimate of the expert's commands. Now, the expert uses its exact commands to drive to the next position. Our autonomous driver uses its predicted set of steering commands to drive to its next position. And that's where the problems start. Our predicted set of steering commands are a good estimate of what the expert did. But they're not perfect. There is some small error. The result is that after applying the predicted steering commands, the autonomous vehicle ends up in a slightly different position than the expert. Very close, but slightly different. And the cycle repeats. The autonomous vehicle grabs another image from the camera. This time, however, the image it captures will be a little different to what the expert's camera sees, as the vehicles are in slightly different positions. With different images, the steering predictions will likely be even further away from what the expert driver does, and hence the autonomous driver will drift a little further away from the expert driver's path. What we see is that the prediction errors, although very small for each independent prediction, start to accumulate as the autonomous vehicle drives, and it slowly diverges from the expert driver's path. From a mathematics perspective, this divergence has a major impact. It means that the data used for training 
no longer matches the data that we see when driving autonomously. The small prediction errors get amplified in the autonomous driver's predict-then-drive closed loop, and the vehicle makes progressively worse driving decisions until it completely veers off the track. From the math perspective, the behavior cloning approach has some problems. But luckily, from a practical implementation perspective, there are some tweaks that we can apply to effectively get around the issues. In the remainder of this video, I will look at two simple empirical approaches that can improve the behavior cloning performance. In a later video, I will look at an alternative approach called Dagger. With the first behavior cloning tweak, the idea is fairly simple. We simply want to expand the range of the training data captured by the expert driver. Instead of sticking to the ideal driving line, we include some oscillating or weaving or zigzagging around the center line. The training data gathers a more diverse set of camera angles, hopefully more representative of what could be seen during autonomous driving. This is the approach suggested by the Donkey Car project. The good thing about this approach is that there are no software changes required. We just change how we drive when collecting some of the training data. The possible negative side effect with this approach, however, is that it feels, in some ways, like we are teaching the vehicle some poor driving habits. We are teaching the vehicle both how to get into trouble, as well as how to get out of it. The second behavior cloning tweak follows the same basic idea, to try and expand the range of the training data collected. By randomly injecting noise into the steering during training, the expert driver gets knocked off the ideal driving line. This gives us the expanded range of camera images and also captures the driver's actions needed to return the vehicle back to the normal driving line. On the positive side, the training data appears to focus directly on fixing our drift problem, how to steer back to the ideal driving line. But on the negative side, to implement this, we need to modify our Raspberry Pi Python code. So with this noise approach, we need to do a few software changes. A quick refresh. When training, we take the expert driver inputs via the keyboard, which pass through the controlling module and get sent out to the speed controller and the steering servo. We capture the images from the camera and save them. Same with the control data. Together, this data is used to produce the training data. Now with the noise, we want to use it to simply disturb our steering, nudge the vehicle off the ideal driving line, but not record the noise as part of the training data. So if we inject the noise just as it's being sent out from the control module, we should be okay. Just a quick peek at the pseudocode. The only real changes needed were to create a simple helper class to manage the noise injection. In the code, I call it a jolt, so the code includes a random steering jolt class. There are three main parameters. The magnitude, that controls the size of the jolt. The hold count, which controls how long the jolt is applied for. And the probability of injecting a jolt, so how often the steering gets the kick. The class holds an internal variable to store the current value. And it has a single method, nextVal. This gets called in the main control loop to deliver the next value of the jolt. So each time next val gets called, it firstly checks if the current jolt value is still valid, or if we need to calculate a new value. And if a new value is not needed, then we simply return the current jolt value. But if it is time for a change, we need to calculate the new value. The default value is to effectively not apply a jolt. But based on the jolt probability level, we may occasionally inject one. The new jolt comes from a normal distribution, scaled by the magnitude. And finally, the method returns the current jolt value. The random steering jolt class gets instantiated in the vehicle logic class, and gets called within the getNextSpeedSteeringData method. So they are the main changes needed in the software. That kind of wraps up the two tweaks we can apply to behavior cloning. They both just change slightly the way the training data is collected. Now let's give them both a go. Let's go collect some new training data. 
I ended up collecting around 4,000 additional images with the manual weaving approach, and about the same amount with noise injection. So armed with our newly collected data, we went and trained two new policy models. Let's have a look at how things went. We'll start off with our previous results from the plain old behavior cloning approach, just for reference. With the plain old behavior cloning, the policy was trained using a common set of around 20,000 image samples. These were the normal driving behavior, trying to stick as close as possible to the dashed track. There were also an additional 4,000 image samples, again using the normal driving style. In total, around 24,000 images were used to train the policy. And as you saw in the last video, the basic autonomous driving results, well, they were less than ideal. Now for the two new policy models, the weaving trained policy and the noise trained policy. For the weaving trained policy, we combined the 20,000 images from the normal driving with the additional 4,000 weaving images to train the policy. So how did the policy go at autonomous driving? Let's take a look. Well, compared with the original behavior cloning approach, things seem a bit more stable and consistent. The policy can consistently drive around the track. There were no lapses in concentration. So in terms of basic driving, this policy seems okay. Now for the noise trained policy. We combine the common 20,000 images for normal driving with the additional 4,000 images obtained from driving with the injected noise and train the new policy. We then gave it a go at driving around the new track. This policy also seems to be an improvement over the plain old behavior cloning approach. In terms of basic driving, this also gets the thumbs up. So it seems that by providing some additional training data that gives a broader range of input images, it does improve the performance of the policy. But before moving on, it would be good if we had some method of say objectively comparing different policy models. Is the weaving or noise trained policy any better than the other? Or are they equally as good at driving around the track? Well, in order to compare, we need to come up with some metric for measuring goodness. In the next video, I will go into the details of the solution. Here, we will simply use it to compare the two. To assess each policy, what I did was to train a separate neural network model to rate the images collected whilst driving. The neural network allows us to calculate a reward for every captured image. The reward values range from a maximum of one when the dashed track is centered in the image and slowly drops off as the track moves from the center, hitting negative values at the extremes of the image. So after doing an autonomous drive, we simply take the collected set of images from the camera, pass them through this reward neural network and calculate the average reward for the drive. The closer the value is to one, the better the driver. So how did our policy models go? Well, for the original behavior cloning, I won't calculate the reward as it didn't actually pass the basic driving test. But for the weaving trained policy, let's calculate the average reward for the autonomous driving. Overall, there were about five laps in either direction. So when we add up all of these individual rewards and calculate the average, the weaving trained policy came up with an average reward of around 0.78 per image. And for the noise trained policy, again, driving around five laps in either direction, this policy came in slightly better 
with a 0.80 average per image. These results seem to show that the noise approach may give a slightly better driving performance in terms of accuracy. But given the limited data and not exactly apples to apples conditions, it's hard to say. And also, I have not tested things like robustness. So how good are these autonomous drivers? Well, the good thing with this reward metric is that we can also apply it to the images recorded whilst I was driving. So taking the car for a manual spin on the same circuit. And my results, I come in with an average reward around 0.85, which is a relief. I appear to be a better driver than all of the trained policies. It will be interesting to see how long I can stay on top. So, it's good to see that finally, we can at least train a policy model to consistently drive around the track. And with the reward metric, we have a mechanism to be able to more objectively compare the performance of the policies. In the next video, I will run through some of the details of the reward metric and how it's calculated, which sets up for the future videos that focus on hopefully improving the policy models. The overall target to soundly beat the expert driver. So till then, if you want to follow the overall project, please hit the subscribe button and feel free to like or comment.